You should have a copy of today's sermon. You can follow along. We've been talking about the uh, blood of Christ, and so I'm interrupting that message today to talk to you about something different in, in relation to Christmas. And um, first, to begin with, I want you to turn your Bibles or your iPhones to Matthew chapter 25. And these are the words of Jesus. And the setting is, and what he's discussing is something in the future. And so the setting for this passage of Scripture is the final judgment when Christ returns. And it begins in verse 31 through 46. I want to read this passage of Scripture and then uh, make it relevant to you this morning. Beginning in verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit up on the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. That's a good place to be. But the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we hungry, saw you hungry, and fed you, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, For as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall they say also, under them on the left hand, the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devils and the angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? And he shall answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as he did it not to one of the least of these, he did it not to me. And there shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous and the life eternal. We see here the final judgment that God is the one who discerns and makes a separation between those who are righteous and unrighteous. He, he uses the metaphor sheep and goats. Now, the thing that we don't know is really what goes on in the heart of a person. We cannot, I cannot, you cannot look into the heart of another person and judge if they belong to Jesus or do not belong to Jesus. Now, everybody who's ever lived, everybody doesn't go to heaven. We're not universalists. We are very particular in our theology. We say there's only one way to God the Father, and that's through Jesus. He's the one mediator. No one else, Mary or a saint or a priest or a pastor, is not the mediator. There's only one mediator. There's only one person who can reconcile each and every one of us unto God the Father, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Atheists and agnostics will argue that and say, you're so narrow-minded, you're so particular. Well, 
when you study the other Eastern religions, they are particular also. The people, Islam. Now, monotheistic, in a sense, and they say no infidel will go into heaven. Muhammad, he's the one who's chosen to bring us unto God. And if you won't bend your knee, then we'll take your head off. So you see the radical Islamists, even today, where you saw the news clips where they took people who would not renounce their Christianity and they cut their head off. And we used to think that was done, what, thousands of years ago? Unfortunately, that is happening in the world today. But there's a difference between the religions of the world and Christianity. And we see here the righteous are the ones who by faith responded to the grace and love of Jesus. And what God does, he's the potter, we're the clay. He's the one who initiates salvation. And what troubles a lot of people is that God is sovereign. And he does choose. Many are called, but few are chosen. And at this time of year, I want to thank God because if he left it up to my free will, I would have never chose him. I know that. How do you know that? Because I read the Bible. I read what the Old Testament says. I read what the psalmist says and what Paul said in the third chapter of Romans. It's our nature not to seek God or understand God or go towards him. So God is the initiator of salvation. He comes to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he begins to deal with us, not to put a gun or a, knife, a gun to our head or a knife to our throat, but through the power of love. And I believe that no man or woman can stand before God and say, well, you cannot condemn me to eternal damnation because I never heard the truth. The witness of God is clearly seen in what he's created. And the witness of the power of God. I want to say, I want to thank the Lord that he chose me, he chose you, even before he created the foundations of the earth. And I read this story, and the thing that jumps out to me is one reason God saved you and me, he wants us to represent him in the earth his body. A body has hands, a body has feet, has a head, arms, and legs. Christ is the head of the church. We are the body, and we are to do the ministry, the work of the Lord in the earth. Everybody here has a place, has a part. We're all different, but we all come together, all of us, and we bring our part, our calling, our purpose, and we join it together and work together to glorify the head, not competing with each other, not comparing. Unfortunately, that happens amongst believers and churches. And we try to copy sometimes what other people are doing. We need to hear God do what he calls us to do. Amen? And so the qualifier here in this scripture, where you have done it unto the least of them, You've done it to me. Where you see someone who's in need. And I have found many times you cannot proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ until you first maybe fulfill a need or you show an act of kindness to a person and they see the love of God exuding from you, emanating from you. And then they say, why are you doing this? Because of God's love in me, what he's done for me, I want to give you something that is eternal value. And then the door is open where hopefully you can share the gospel with them. And the gospel is an easy, clear message. If you know John 3.16, you qualify to present the gospel. Amen? And so, we see here that qualifying statement of everything I read, 
I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren and sisters, you were doing it unto me. Sometimes I get in my flesh and I'm saying, you know, I ain't got time to fool with this person. Uh, what, how, what's it going to benefit me? What's it going to benefit the church? Da, 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 da. And God lovingly grabs a hold of me and disciplines me and says, you don't do it for your reasoning or your thinking. As you've done it under the least of them, you've done it under me. So that really sunk into my head. And sometimes... I'll see that maybe there's no benefit or what I'm thinking or what I'm doing. And when you do it under the Lord, even if someone takes advantage of you and uses you, they can't because I do it as unto the Lord. Take that meal to that person or call that person or spend time with that person, which maybe could be an inconvenience, uh, you know, and you see the person, you know, not being grateful, thankful, using you. But I don't do it so much for them. I do it as unto the Lord. Unto the That's the gospel. Live out the word of God. It's easy to be nice to someone who's giving you accolades and who's nice and sweet. But then someone gets in your face and says nasty and inhumane things and takes advantage of you, you still love them. You can break the power of the enemy through the love and power of Jesus and the gospel. Now, I'm going to give you a story that happened on Christmas Eve in 1985. It happened in a little city in Chester, Nebraska. And it grabbed a hold of me what happened in that community because I've gone to Chester Chester, Nebraska, and Hebron, and Ong, and Edgar, years ago, and did a lot of pheasant hunting in that area. Famir met a lot of people, preached in a couple of churches there, reached out to several families, so I, still, I have a connection there. And so I read about a story, this story, this event, a real story that happened on Christmas Eve in 1985, I read about this in Reader's Digest, and it was in 1987. And the title of this story in the Reader's Digest, a true story that happened in this small committee at about 323 people. Now it's 100 less. People of the earth. You might say the salt of the earth. Farmers. And the title of this story was Little Boy Blue. And wh what grabbed me was I'd been there. And I was familiar with the topography, the roads, everything was kind of like in a square. You went down this road. I mean, there wasn't any curves in the highway. It was just everything was squared off. It was dirt roads, and on the side of dirt roads were large ditches because of all the irrigation that took place and the pivots set up to irrigate the big cornfield, the soybeans or the wheat, wherever they were growing. And what happened on Christmas Eve in 1985 was this man, by the name of Chuck Cleveland, left Chester, and he's driving out to Hebron to get a haircut because in Chester, evidently, there wasn't a barber. Only a 12-mile journey. It's, in, it's cold. There's snow on the ground. And he's driving along. And something catches his peripheral vision. He sees something in the ditch. I mean, those ditches are about so wide and about so deep. He sees something blue. What in the world? I mean, he, he's driven that a number of times, so... You know, he sees something out of the ordinary, it catches his eyes. So he turns around and comes back, gets out of his truck, walks over, and there lying in the ditch is a little boy, dead. And no identification. 
This is a mystery. And who in the world would leave a little boy in a ditch? Here's Christmas Eve. And, I mean, just like, you know, you're driven along, you see a deer that's been hit by a car laying on the side of the road. You know, it, there's a problem in our world today, particularly here in America, and just not America, the lack for the sanctity of life. You know, the, the Bible says the shedding of innocent blood, God abhors that, and that's one thing that he hates. And we legalized that here in America back in 1973. Wonder why we have such a divider in our nation. We told God, jump out of here, get lost, forget you. And so this guy, he, 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 so he, goes home because I mean this road's not travel there's not traffic like here we have and he, he runs into his house and he, he's just in shock the first thing he does he runs into the room of his son was a little boy about the same age as see is my son okay he, he, he you know knowing that that wasn't his son but he, he has these, these emotions and things are going in his head he runs in there he sees that his son's secure. His wife says, what is wrong with him? He comes back and he says, I found a little boy just down the road lying in a ditch covered with snow. Dead. How could someone do that? Because the little boy had to have a mom and a dad. I mean, he just didn't fall out of the sky. Someone purposely dropped that little boy and left him in there, in that ditch. And the little boy, two years later, they found out who he was. His name was Danny Stutzman. It was an Amish boy who grew up in Dalton, Ohio. And his father left him in that ditch and went on from there to Texas. I'm not going to go in detail about his father because the man is dead now and probably justice is being served. It didn't, I, don't have, I can't judge the man's heart, but from all indications... He was messed up. He was, he was broken and never came about. But what I want to communicate to you this morning from this story is how it impacted this small community in Chester, Nebraska. Here's how this community died. I mean, this, these people did not know this little boy. Didn't know him. Complete stranger. And this shocked the core values and the hearts of the people in this small farming community. And here's how they responded. They said that these people came together and honored this little boy that they did not know. The community pulled their resources together they um, provided a funeral home to take care, a casket. They provided a cemetery plot for him. And it says they had a funeral service for him. And there was 232 people in that community. And 400 people showed up to honor the life of this little boy. So that was more than the population of Chester, Nebraska. And what happened, they named the little boy, not knowing his name, Matthew, meaning a gift of God. So they're invoking God into this entire situation. It, it, the Lord got to the core values, to the heart of these people. And it says, this ordeal 
softened the hearts and the people in that community and brought them together and they began to appreciate one another. If there was any divide or animosity, it seemed to just fade away. And, and this ordeal, this horrific thing, galvanized these people together. And there was an outpouring of love towards a little boy who was a complete stranger. You see, the people now, as opposed to prior to this, were more caring to one another. It, it, and you might say God takes something that's horrific and ungodly and brings good out of it. It says also that many of the people were so impacted by finding this little boy in a ditch that it caused them to reevaluate their life goals, their vocations, and begin to choose things that would bless other people and honor God. I said, little Danny taught them something that they would never have received or gotten from any other situation. And so, what this caused me to do, I said, well, what, what's the b biblical application? What, what's the scriptural purpose of this? And I, I come back to what I read to you this morning from Matthew chapter 25. Here on Christmas Eve, when we come to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and, and sometimes we get caught up maybe in the whole drama of, of Christmas that maybe we forget what's really most important, honoring God thanking God for his redemptive purpose in our heart and life and our families and coming together and really truly worshiping God and honoring him and then saying to the Lord, the way I really honor you and praise you as I have done it unto the least of them, I realize I'm doing it unto you. So as I come to church more than just to get something and we want to enjoy the presence of God, but also to give something, just not on Sunday, but throughout the entire week. So I look at the scripture I read to you this morning, and what comes to my mind is when you and me stand before God, at the end of time, it says, when he comes back with his angels, and it says at that, at that day, essentially two questions will be presented. Two questions will be answered at the return of the Lord. Verse one was, who will enter into the kingdom of God? Amen. Who will enter into the kingdom of God? Now, we put a lot of emphasis up on our free will and our responsibility. But the only one that you and I can answer for is ourselves. I can't answer for my wife, my children. I can't answer for you. You can't answer for me. We all stand before God and have to give account of our lives. And so when I'm thinking about this, the Lord has a standard. I mean, he's the one who comes and he's the one who determines and looks at the heart of man. You're a sheep, you're a goat. Or if you're looking at me, you're a sheep, you're a goat. He determines who's righteous. You know why he can determine that? Because he's the righteous judge. It says to you and me that we cannot make that judgment call. Now, we see people and we say, I look at that person's behavior and actions, do they really know Jesus? You see, we have the tendency to make a value judgment based upon works. And we know that salvation is not through works of righteousness, but it's based on the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God, and the faithful response of the person to say yes to God. It's kind of like the two working together. You've got the sovereignty of God, and you've got the will of man. And somehow, in God's divine providence, he says both of them work together. But God is the one who makes the decision who is righteous, 
who's unrighteous. And so the standard that's set, and this is why it's so important for us, whatever we do, we always make the gospel connection. So I want to read a scripture to you, Romans chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's the standard. That's what did you do with Jesus? God, I want to enter the kingdom of God. Look at all the good things I did. I was reading some apologetics this week, and, and people said, and I've heard people say, well, if God would prove himself to me and demonstrate that he's God, that I would believe. You know what the answer is down through the ages? They wouldn't believe. Blessed are those who have never seen or never heard and yet believe. Now, I, I have never seen a dead person come alive. Now, I know that's happened. I see it in the Bible. I've heard about that happening even in times we live in. I never have seen an angel. I never had where Jesus came when I saw him in his flesh and all his glory. But I have experienced the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost where he came and grabbed me and it was just as real as me touching something or seeing something, hearing something. It was deeper than my five natural senses could touch and it's the same for you that all of a sudden God visited me and I said, yes, I submit. I give you my life. And as you as believers did the same thing. And, and I, that burned in my heart and mind. It was so real. Yet I couldn't prove with any empirical evidence, but I know that I know that I know it's something of the Spirit. That's what I told the high school buddy of mine. He said, I'm an atheist. And then he wanted to argue the Bible. I said, are you nuts? I said to him, and you may have heard me say this already, I said, your worldview is totally different from mine because you're trying to approach God from an intellectual, reasoning, humanistic way, and you can't. You have to approach God from a faith relationship and believe and confess. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. He says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Savior and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will not perish. That's gospel. Amen? And you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to understand how everything started, you know, what the Bible says, he took nothing and made something, and that has to be based on faith and not on intellect. Amen? So that's the standard. The standard is that God judges the hearts of men by Jesus Christ and the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus is the good news. He is the truth. Amen? Here's where it really gets down to the nitty-gritty, the second question. What will be your place in the kingdom, and what will qualify you to reign with him? Now, I've heard preachers say this, oh, we're all going to reign and rule with him. That's not talking about entrance into the kingdom. That's talking about being responsible, and as you have done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. Jesus said, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be effective, he says in his teachings, you must be willing to be a servant of all. You must be, Jesus said, I came, he set the standard, he set the example. I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give my life. So he says, this, that's what we have to do. If you want to, Know that place, establish that place, and reign with him. Then he looks at me, he says, when I was hungry, 
Did you give me something to eat when I was thirsty? Did you give me something to drink when I was sick? Did you come and pray for me when I was in prison? Did you visit me when I was lonely and a stranger? I ain't got time for you. That's what I enjoyed about many of you during Thanksgiving, which is important to be with our families, hallelujah, and enjoy a wonderful meal and give thanks to the Lord. But going down in Woodstock and reaching out to the needy and dispossessed and giving them a good Thanksgiving meal, but also sharing Jesus and the gospel, Jesus and the gospel with them and touching their heart and life. And now, a lot of those people may have got there and just said, I get the meal, I'm out of here, I got something good, I got this, I got that. And we say, well, they just came and ripped us off. You go in there with the attitude, I've done this not so much as unto them, but as unto the Lord. As you've done unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. And, and, and if you do that, then God says, you qualify to reign and rule with me. That's what he's saying here. The first, for, yeah, praise God, I get in the kingdom, but, you know, God redeemed me, he saved you, and so he's saying, what I want you to do, church, I want you to serve me by serving others. The, the vision of our church is to love God, love others, and change the world. That means we got to take what God has given to each and every one of us. God's called some of you people here because you're extroverts to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a Billy Graham. Just You know God's called you, reach out, and you're just used of God. Some here are exhorters just to come along. Sometimes, you know, even though you are doing a lot of good things, it's good to, for your wife, for your husband, or for your friend to come and say, you're doing a good job. I got a a Christmas card from a dear friend of mine, another minister. And in that Christmas card, he wrote a note and just poured out his heart. He says, I want to thank you that you went on many kingdom adventures with me. I want to thank you when I was at my lowest place. You didn't judge me. You loved me. I want to thank you for being my friend. I said, wow, that's, I can't put any value on that. And, and, and I, I didn't do it for myself. I did it as unto the Lord. And it just over a period of 30 years, just <coughs> been acting like a believer. That is, we need that in the body of Christ. That's why at times I say, just stand and just go ahead and greet each other. Because a lot of times, if you go to a, some churches you go in and go out and you never even say hello to anybody or no one ever says hello to you because people, not that they don't want to do that, they're, they get preoccupied. I don't want to get so busy in my life that I can't pick up the phone and call someone and encourage them, amen? Or minister to children or teens or reach out sometimes to a complete stranger. <laughs> when I went... Uh, last week to um, Dr. Elner, who's the pain doctor. I have a little bit of pain. I call it uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh. So I see people sitting there because what he does, he takes a big needle and he sticks it in there where the problem is and then injects a steroid. So I see this lady there, an older lady, probably younger than me, but and I says, you're going in to get the prayer of faith and the needle of assurance. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> and I end up talking to the nurse, and uh, she asked me questions about who was that lady It was the problem with uh, Sarah and Abraham. Oh, Hagar. And I explained it. She, oh, you, you know the Bible. Oh, a little bit. I didn't tell her I was a preacher. And she kept asking questions. I kept asking, well, I, well my goodness, you know. And just had a, a live discussion. I mean, you, you, you just, you don't have to, to touch people. You don't have to be a person who's been in a, 
gone to a theological institution to get your MDiv or your PhD or a THD or this or that. He just, where God has gifted you as you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. And so when I come out of sitting there, and so I strike up a conversation, a lot of times we just let things go by and we never engage people. So I always see an opportunity and, and so use my gift and calling and just begin the conversation. And I said, did you get a needle in the back, in the head, the arm, the leg, or whatever, and start a conversation? Always invoke God into it. Amen? You, you, everybody can do that here. I like Gilda. Gilda, 90 years old, Gilda? She's an evangelist. She just comes out and she's just, do you know Jesus? You go turn or burn, heaven or hell, get right. Uh, she don't quite do it that way, but she's not afraid. Now, some of us might not be doing that, but these people in Chester, Nebraska, this little boy who was a complete stranger, it got to the core of their belief system, the heart. And they begin to realize that this thing probably was not orchestrated by God, but God embowed himself thereafter and using this opportunity to touch that community. And it changed the mindset of these people. My prayer, and that, of course, Reader's Digest didn't report it and other things, but I'll bet you that some people in that city had to come to Jesus meeting. I believe it. Now, when I think about what the scripture, I, I just want to say three things that God has predetermined for you and me is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And just I'm outlining this scripture. Now listen to this. We are God's, if you fill in the blank, workmanship. He says, I've started this work in you. I'm gonna, we're God's work. He's the one that made you like you are. Your height, your width, your life, you're God's workmanship. He, he didn't just redeem you so you just go to heaven. He's got a purpose. You, you and me, the incarnate Christ here on earth, the church, we're his workmanship. The second thing, we were created to do good works. Now, good works doesn't save us, but after you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, God has something that he's ordained for each and every one of us. Amen? There's some things in, that we need, that I need to help. We have a sign out there. And we need to change that sign maybe every two weeks. We have probably over 25,000 people every day that pass by this church. And I've got a lot of messages from the community. People never attend this church, but they read that sign. And that sign communicates to them. Merry Christmas. You know what the sign says out there? Merry Christmas. Jesus didn't come to make men good. He came to make them alive. Now next week I'll change one little thing on there. He came, they said, what do you mean make alive? What, what, what's that preacher saying up there? He came to give you eternal life. I just, I'll change that later in the week because they drive by and they see it every time they go by. And surprise how many people, that's a ministry. So I need someone to do that. It's easy. It only takes about five minutes. I drive my truck up there, stand up there, but I, I enjoy doing that because I know I can reach a lot of people through that sign who never come to this church. But I'll tell you what to say if you come up with a good spiritual thing. You don't put something corny up there, you know. Uh, you better come here. If you don't, you're going to hell. Something, don't, you know, say that. I, I just may, but you see, that's a ministry right there. You could reach 25,000 people a day. Another thing, as you've done unto the least of them, you've done unto me. Friday night fun we have here, where parents come, 
and they drop the children off. We feed them, usually pizza, because they all love pizza, and we teach them the Word of God and love on them. And a lot of those kids who come, they'll have up to maybe uh, 15 kids, but more want to come because they're going to take more people. So they start at uh, 6.30 and go to 9 o'clock. Now, some people work with children well. I don't. But I help out. As you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. I help out. So if someone acts up, all right, I want to go over there and put a little uh, hands on. <laughs> like, you know, nail them to the wall and let them hang there. All right? Not to kill them, just let them hang there. But... I can help out by serving the food, cleaning up afterwards. You see, Wayne does that. Hallelujah. Wayne used to sell potato chips. chips. Now he gives kids potato chips. What a gifting. (laughs) Amen. That's important. I mean, another, uh, several things. Uh, We're going to do a garden again this year. I want to supervise. Amen? And we want to train our kids and take the metaphors in the Bible and use that to communicate to the kids about working and earning a good living and using it to bless not only them but other people. So there are a number of things. So we'll make a list. We want you to grab a hold of If you can do it unto the least of them, you did it unto me, Jesus said. Here's the last thing I want to say in Ephesians 2.10. God has ordained that we walk out what he has planned for us. Now, he's not going to force us. But God has a plan here and a purpose and a place for every single person. That's how a church grows. Amen? A church grows by people interacting and reaching out to people. And say, I want to share something with you. This is where I go on a weekly basis to get blessed and fed. I would like to invite you. So here's the key word that will really qualify you and help you understand your place in God's kingdom, in his church, and qualify you to reign with him. Here's the one thing that God looks for. Faithfulness. You can find that in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, and Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. What God is looking for, when I come back to earth, will I find faith? Are you faithful? That's what God, that's what will qualify you to reign. You see, there's a, a lady who taught me the scriptures, and she's gone me with the Lord. She wrote several volumes on the work of the Holy Spirit. And one thing I realized from her teachings was what God is looking for is not for us maybe to do what we think, write a bestseller or become the greatest evangelist or the greatest church or whatever we think. What God looks for, he looks for faithfulness. Are you faithful what God's placed in your hand? You see, all you got to do is start with what God's placed in your hand. It could be a little uh, morsel of bread and a little wine, and you take that and believe God, and when you give it to the Lord, he breathes upon it and increases it. Amen? Faithfulness. And so when you look back at this story about little boy blue, they learned the value of the sanctity of life to appreciate one another and they cared for the least amongst them. And it changed this community. Amen? And God wants to continually change us. Change us how? To conform us under the image of Jesus that we become more Christ-like. Can you say amen? Please stand.